Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Olivia C Podcast. This episode, I have Samantha Schwann with me, award-winning underwater photographer with a special eye for sharks. So sharks are a critical part of the ocean's ecosystem, and she aims to have sharks seen under a different light to keep those ecosystems alive. So thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you for having me. So to jump right in um, and get to know you a little bit more, Mm -hmm. where did you grow up and where did this love for the ocean start for you? I'm originally from the uh, west coast of Canada, so Vancouver Island. It's a small little island just off the west coast. And that's where I started diving. So I kind of got into it by accident. Um, when I was in grade 11, every year they made us go on these out week trips. So it was a week of camping. Or whatever. And I was really late turning in my form and scuba was the only thing left. Okay. <laughs> so I didn't really have any other choice. Um, but I, when I dived, I really enjoyed it. And then when I did my advanced course, which was the next course after my beginning, mm-hmm. that's when I absolutely fell in love. I remember the exact moment. It was a deep dive and visibility was really, really low just because there was this layer of plankton. Mm-hmm. And because we were diving deeper, we were able to get below this layer mm-hmm. and everything just totally opened up. And I remember just absolutely falling in love with diving right there. Do you, uh, do you remember seeing any marine animals or anything? Yeah, the funny thing was, is it was a really big wall dive. So this wall, you know, plunged down to 200 feet and there was a sea lion there and there was a school of fish. Like our visibility was probably 130 feet. Mm-hmm. So I could see all That's around. Really good. Yeah, it was really, really, really amazing. I think, which is one of the, the the main reasons I loved it but yeah Vancouver Island it's actually the Emerald Sea it's, is what it's called because it has this really amazing green color because of all the plankton yes. mm-hmm. and it's actually rated number two in the world for diving I, by yes. Jack. so I yeah pictures for stuff in Canada and I want to go it's just I heard the water's so cold it, it can be yeah it, it's a little bit um it's a little bit frosty especially during winter time which is when the best you know, diving is, but if you go in a dry suit, it's actually pretty warm. You just yes. wear whatever you want underneath and it's pretty toasty. And I heard the colors are really bright as well. Absolutely. So for example, anywhere else where you might get like a sea star, which is mm-hmm. maybe this big, I don't know if people can see, mm-hmm. but you know, maybe um, it's the size of like a tapas plate, yeah. you know, there because there's so much food in the water you get sea stars which are the sizes of dinner plates so oh everything gosh. is just really really massive mm-hmm. and you get the exact same colors it's really really cool and so is that how you started photography no it's funny because so i started diving and then i really got into it by the time i was 19 years old i i had set the canadian women's depth record Um, I had a couple of records underneath me and and I was teaching. I was just like full blown passion into diving. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what, when I was like 26 or something, I had, I had a bit of an accident, which took me out of diving for a while. And so I got into skydiving. Oh, that's cool. (laughs) And so I got, I totally stumbled into photography by accident. I was looking to just become a skydiving photographer on the weekends to kind of help me with, you know, paying for my jumps and stuff. Okay. So I traded in a bunch of my grandfather's old camera equipment. Thankfully it was nothing rare. And (laughs) I got my very first camera and I started teaching myself how to use it. So I was basically along, you know, the coast of Vancouver, just shooting whatever I could, just figuring out how to use it. And I really discovered that I loved it. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it gave me this artistic expression, which I had kind of been looking for my whole life. My mom is an artist. I come from a family of artists. But my passion, you know, I'd always just been working in sculpture. And I had done a lot of stone sculpture and a lot of metal sculpture. Mm-hmm. And so when I really got into photography, I just knew that it was the, the medium that I had really been looking for. Um, it was, you know, stone takes forever you know, and metal, I ended up chopping the tip of my finger off. So photography was definitely a little bit faster, a little bit safer. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but it just it was that like as soon as i as soon as i started shooting i just knew it was just in my heart that was it and so it was only a couple of years ago maybe i guess four years ago now that the two came together so um after i started shooting i i put together a couple shows i was you know pretty involved in landscape photography exhibiting mm -hmm. and all that stuff but I really wasn't doing any water, any underwater stuff until a few years ago when I purchased my first housing. And then ever since then, as soon as I had my housing, I knew, and those two passions really had to come together. And, and that's basically all I do now is underwater. Have you tried doing any video or you just stick to straight photography? No, I actually have because, um, especially for conservation work, it's a really good, um, Thing to have is to be able to show video mm -hmm. and so what two years ago I, I did some training down in Florida with um, a multi Emmy award-winning underwater cinematographer he was really amazing he was offering this this course on underwater cinematography and it looked wow. amazing and he did a lot of work with sharks and so he's actually really impacted my career in a lot of ways um, and it, like he kind of really opened up that that door to the underwater cinematography side. It's not something that I really um, do a lot of, mainly because I really prefer stills, but mm -hmm. it's challenging. And it I think it really adds that third dimension to a lot of, you know, a lot of these experiences. So right now, you know, I have a little GoPro. The GoPros right now are yeah. absolutely amazing I know um, you know my little GoPro takes better footage than I think my whole camera rig does it's right not. and they're so easy and light you can just take them anywhere yeah, yeah that's yeah. the best part absolutely and I mean the stability on them is great so mm -hmm. um, I have I basically have my GoPro just mounted on the top and then whenever there's something kind of exciting coming our way then I'll usually put together you know some clips so oh, that's a good idea so yeah you just put it on top of your housing and your rig yeah, oh, totally. Sweet. Yeah, it makes it super easy. So, and then what else have I done? Yeah, I've done some other stuff with night times at sharks. We'll talk about it a little bit later, but you know, I've been working on some stuff with sound and sharks. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing some video of the sharks on the rigs and stuff like that. So yeah. So how did you get into sharks though? What made you choose out of everything in the ocean? How why did you pick sharks? Um, well, I think overall. They are so important. So they're what's called a keystone species, mm -hmm. which means um, that for them, like for their environment, the ocean really depends on sharks. Uh, without a healthy population, the entire ecosystem just goes completely out of balance. Yes. So there are keystone species in other ecosystems. So for example, the wolves in Yellowstone, and we've seen what were, was happened in that area. So what a lot of people don't understand is that it really affects us down from the food that we eat to the ocean pH level to everything mm -hmm. without a healthy population of them. Um, so it's not so much that I think that everybody needs to love sharks or, or wants to necessarily get in the water with them. Right. But uh, for me as an artist, it's really important that I can do whatever I can to show the side that I've seen with them. So that perhaps some of that fear that people have is replaced with fascination for them because they are really incredible animals. Yeah, and they're beautiful. Yeah. Thanks. They're, I'm glad you I'm I love sharks so much. My favorite is the whale shark. And ah. that's my dream is to swim with the whale shark. Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Do you have yeah. a favorite? They're really, really amazing. They're so sweet and gentle. Oh my you know? gosh. Um, but you don't want to get stuck up next to one. Just... Right. <laughs> I'll, I'll see the one from the distance and if I can get cl as close as I can. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a favorite shark? I do. I really love the Mako. So mm -hmm. the Mako um, is the world's fastest shark. It can swim up to speeds of 70 miles per hour, which is really neat. Um, and I think what I really love about it, they're warm blooded. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're truly the athletes of the ocean. So they have a number one, I mean, they're a, incredible athleticism, uh, the speed, they're also able to breach 20 feet or higher out of the air. Um, but they also possess the highest brain to body ratio of any of the sharks. 
And so in studies, they've been found to be really shy, really curious, but able to um, do like critical uh, problem solving. So they're smart. Wow. And one of the most interesting things that I read about them is that, you know, in studies, they've actually shown preferences to researchers who showed them kindness. So wow. and this is something that, you know, I've seen with a lot of different species that we've been diving with is, is that they're not just mindless eating machines. Mm -hmm. You know, they have personalities. Uh, if you know as much as sharks can have a personality right. but they have preferences and they're different and they're not just you know there to eat everything in sight i think with the makos too that they're very interactive so um they get uh, really jazzed up uh by the reflection in, in the camera dome and then also i have these big powerful lights and the powerful lights emit like the strong electrical uh impulse or pulse Mm -hmm. And the sharks are kind of really attracted by that. So it's nice because they're bold, but not too bold. And they're not shy like a lot of other species are. Okay. So really, really fun to be in the water with. It's crazy because I read in like my research, a lot of uh, when they label those sharks, they uh -huh. label them as aggressive. So it's, it's surprising to me as um, that you get in the water. When you were doing your presentation, I first heard you talk about them. I was like, she's in the water with these sharks. And I've always thought they were aggressive yeah. and that I shouldn't be in the water with these sharks. Ah, uh, yeah. And it, I think it's a thing, it's a common misconception, even with a lot of sharks, um, you know, even bull sharks or tiger mm -hmm. sharks get these. And yes, I mean, they're, they're sharks, but they're, I mean, it, they're aggressive with other sharks. They're aggressive if people are, you know, for example, probably where they get that with the Makos is they're heavily fished for sport. You know, okay. and so when people are reeling them in, I mean, they're, these sharks are fighting for their lives. Yes. So they're definitely, you know, can be a little bit more aggressive. But um, with humans, not so much. I think the only sharks that I've really found, um, not to be aggressive, but the ones where you have to kind of look after the mm -hmm. outdoor would be, you know, silkies. You, you, and I think I, I talked about this in, in the yeah. present. So there's this thing called, it's called rule number one. And the rule number one is you always keep your eyes on the shark at all times. Mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, if you have a bigger species like tigers um, or, or also silkies. So the ones that if you keep your eyes off of them or if you look away, then, then they start to get into a little bit of, you know, impish behavior. So silkies will often stalk you, you know. They won't do anything, but they just... <laughs> They're right behind you. So keep my eye open. Gotcha. You've got to keep rule number one <laughs> for sure. And then, so have you been in a situation where you had to make sure you keep your eyes on the shark and you felt it was being aggressive towards you or? Uh, with tigers, uh, the head is always on the swivel, you know, mm -hmm. so it, it and, and it's not like I ever feel like I never, I'm always very relaxed in the water. I, I never feel um, threatened by them. Mm -hmm. uh, but there has been one situation with a silky shark where I had to get out of the water. And it was in Cabo San Lucas off the coast. And I was filming a hammerhead. And this beautiful little hammerhead was coming in, very, very shy. Hammerheads are extremely shy. Mm -hmm. And I had spent a good 10, 15 minutes trying to build up a rapport with this shark um, so that it would kind of come close enough to me to get a shot. And we were, it, we were using bait, so it was getting a little bit of a snack. And mm -hmm. out of nowhere, the silky comes up. And silkies are pretty big. They're, they can get up to about nine to 10 feet. No, they're big. The silky comes up and rams the hammerhead. Mm -hmm. And they get into this massive shark bite. You know, if you've ever seen like a dog fight at the park, that's exactly what this was like. Oh my God but it was like four feet in front of my face. And so I'm busy snapping away thinking, man, this is great. And there's chunks of tuna flying everywhere. And I remember thinking, oh, I might be a little bit too close. <laughs> and just as that happened, you know, the silky won the, the fight with the hammerhead and then it started coming after me. And what they do is they'll come and they'll come aggressively. So they'll come and they'll just bump you. 
Yeah. And bumping is okay. When you're diving with sharks, circling is fine. Bumping is okay. Um, but when they start getting more and more aggressive, it's that's when it's time to get out. And really, that whole experience was a huge learning thing for me because it was really my fault. What I had done is I had really gotten too close uh, to the bait, and the shark viewed me as competition. So it okay. wasn't seeing me as as a, you know food source or anything like right. that. It was it didn't want to bite me, and it didn't want to eat me by any means. It mm -hmm. just wanted that food source for itself. I see. And so yeah. when you are in the water with these sharks, so you mentioned that they're so close, do you never get in a cage? No. Yeah. Um, mainly because there's no need. Um, so there's no need. And, um, you know, even the, what we're finding with great whites is mm -hmm. that you really don't need a shark is a shark is a shark. Right. So there are some sh individual sharks where, yes, it's not safe to be in the water with them. So you really need to be with somebody who knows the sharks, who's like a shark expert for that right. species. Um, but for the ones that I've been diving with, uh, I've always been very, very comfortable. So the vibe that you put off is really, really important. Mm -hmm. And there are certain things that you do. For example, you know, if the shark is coming towards you, you, know, you never back away. So you always face, face it. You always maintain that eye contact. You know, you are presenting yourself as, as a bigger version, you know, that you're, um, not, uh, prey. So you really have to have that confidence. And for the most part, you know, they're really curious and shy and it's, n it's never, um, it's never really been a, a, a battle, you know? I heard they're, they're really shy. Like I've been to a few places like Bali and stuff and mm -hmm. I've seen a few sharks, but yeah. it's always in the distance. I can never want, get one really close to me. You have to gain yeah. that relationship. And that's the thing. They're really, really shy mm -hmm. you know, for the most part. So, you know, when you do have an experience where they come around you or, or do get close, it, it's really, you know, in my view anyway, it's, it's more of a gift than anything else. Yes. Because it's such a magical experience. Oh my gosh, yes. The more sharks I can see, the better. I think they're just gorgeous. And I think, I think a lot of people are just scared because on the news too, we see all these shark attacks and a lot more <laughs> keep happening recently. And is that news or has that always been something that there's been a, a ton of shark attacks and we're just now finding out about it or we're just talking about it well i think there's um and again depending on you know where it is but i mean typically there tends to be a rash um and it's never that they're going specifically after humans mm -hmm. um it's typically that humans are in their environment. So if we're swimming at a beach, then there's, there's going to be sharks around. And typically what it is, is it's a bite and release. So sharks have little taste cells inside their mouth. And as soon as they bite onto something and realize that it's not food, then they release. Um, so for the most part, it's mistaken identity. Mm -hmm. So they don't really have that great of eyesight. And especially with surfers, you know, Surfers look a lot like turtles or seals or yeah. something that's prey. So for the most part, um, it tends to be just wrong place, wrong time. Mm -hmm. They, uh, for example, down in Florida, you know, you have massive shark migrations mm -hmm. and these sharks are following the food source. So if their food source tends to be along a beach or a coastline or something like that, that tends to be when you get a lot of, uh, more of the accidental bites. Um, for the rest of the species, you know, it, it, it can be tough to say, you know, I mean, for us, you know, there's very rarely, rarely any uh, shark attacks on divers. No, it's rare. No. It's all free divers or snorkelers yeah. or surfers. I and think. you know what? Free divers and uh, the thing with uh, free divers, it's they're always after the food, you yeah. know, that's the thing. And it tends to be the free divers have made a mistake. You know, they, they, you know, you have to get that, that catch up quick as soon as possible you know mm -hmm. and if the shark is going after it you gotta let it go you mean like when they're spear fishing or something yeah yes. exactly. okay yeah okay. yeah because i think that's what happened to the there was a kid in la jolla or san diego 
Mm -hmm. He was spearfishing and he was getting, he was hunting for lobster and that's what happened. There was, he had a shark bite right there. Yeah. I think it was, they say it was a great white, but I feel like every time in the news, they always label it a great white. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And that's the thing. I think the great whites get a bad rap, although they definitely are up in that area. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they get a bad rap for sure. You know? So what's your best dive site to go to and like do research or take photos? Well, um, so if I'm specifically going on a shark dive, uh, there's quite a few places depending on the species. So I tend to travel a lot to the Sea of Cortez. So uh, I fly over to Cabo and uh, there's um, a couple sites just about two miles off the coast of Cabo is what's called the Continental Shelf. And the continental shelf drops off to about 6,000 feet. And so in that area, you have a, a lot of different pelagic animals which are coming through. You know, they're on migration routes or they're into that area to feed. They're going up into Baja to feed. And so that's one of my favorite places where you can go and dive. And the cool thing is, is you don't have to be a certified diver there's places that, um, you know, I go out with Cabo Shark Dive and they, you know, it doesn't matter uh, your experience level because it's all snorkeling. Exactly. So we'll go out and we'll be able to get in the water with many different species. So makos, uh, blues, uh, hammerheads, uh, silkies, which are kind of <laughs> my least favorite, but, <laughs> but, but those guys. And it was kind of cool because last February, so I think we were talking about this before, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, Australia were using um, sound to attract sharks. And what they were doing is they were actually using music. Okay. And so they found that there was a certain genre of music, a certain band, and even down to two specific songs that they were finding would attract the great whites better than bait. And it ended up being uh, ACDC. Out of everything. <laughs> so they like Back in Black mm -hmm. and uh, You Shook Me All Night Long. <laughs> so they were having such success with this that they actually ended up switching primarily to music and not using bait at all. Um, so anyway, I read this and I'm like, man, I got to try this. I want to try it down in Cabo mm -hmm. with Makos because Makos are a cousin right? They're pretty much, well, just like little great whites. Mm -hmm. And so I went and I, I bought a speaker, which was a whole other podcast because man, that took a while. But then got a speaker, went down and uh, we decided to try it out. And we had no idea how the sharks were going to react to this. Mm -hmm. um, so because it was a different species. So we didn't want to take any paying customers on board. It was just myself and a marine biologist and a shark handler who was like really experienced uh and then a boat captain and we went off and uh we basically we went to the continental shelf we dropped down the speaker mm -hmm. about 30 feet of water and we started blaring acdc and we waited and the first hour nothing came second hour nothing came third hour i'm like sweating you know <laughs> because i'm like man i jumped just like invested all this money i hope i hope something happens and we finally got a bite on the line and it was a blue shark which is kind of funny because we weren't really used to seeing them very often and we get in the water and within three hours we had five blue sharks which was a record for the company they'd never had so many blue sharks in the water at one time and they stayed with us for over three and a half hours wow which was an ended up being a record day. Mm -hmm. So it was really interesting because they found that, um, you know, there is something to be said about music and how it's attracting sharks. Now, of course, they're not really picky on the band or anything like that. It has more to do with the frequency. They really love that low vibrational pulsing frequency. And the funny thing was, is that uh, while the great whites preferred ACDC, the blue sharks had their preference and it was um, the Beastie Boys <laughs> <laughs> put on one Beastie Boys track just because I knew we were going to be listening to ACDC all day and we're going to 
probably go nuts. So I put on um, Beastie Boys to What You Want. Mm -hmm. And every single time that song came up, we had a blue shark right nestled right up to the speaker. He was just all getting in there. It was hilarious. That's funny. He's probably like, turn ACDC off. I've had yeah, enough right? of it. <laughs> this stuff well at the beginning we weren't sure because every time he'd come up you know um they go right up to the speaker mm -hmm. and you know we weren't sure what they were doing and i didn't want them to eat my speaker you know mainly probably not good for them but yeah. too it was expensive so we'd have the the boat captain like every time they were zooming in we'd have them yank up the speaker Mm -hmm. And then we're finally, once we kind of got a little bit more comfortable, we're like, okay, let's leave it down. Let's see what they do. And it was really funny. They were just like getting all up in there with me. So would you personally use that as a way to lure sharks in and set a bait? Yeah, um, absolutely. Because what they're finding, especially with the great whites, is that a, it, it elicits a more natural response on, be, on behalf of the shark. Mm -hmm. So sometimes what happens when there's food around is, you know, they get all excited. Two, with photographers, you get a much better photo. You don't have big chunks of tuna and mackerel in the way. And it's better for the shark because you're not really interrupting its feeding patterns. Now, typically when you're doing baits, you're not really giving them enough food to interrupt that feeding pattern anyway. Mm -hmm. But if you can do it without any food source whatsoever, I, that's far more ideal. Okay. Now, with the ones that we've been using in, um, in the Sea of Cortez, nobody had ever done this before. So we were the first to try it with any other species, but also anywhere else other than, um, than uh, Australia. So it's been a, it's taken a little bit of convincing to get some of the operators on board. Mm -hmm. Obviously in, you know, in Cabo, they were pretty excited about the results. Um, and then I tried it on some other the liverboards that I was using. Um, and that's been really interesting. That's had a little bit of mixed results because I found that different species react completely different to different types of music. Um, the silkies were really hard to pin down. <laughs> we, uh, we were on a liveaboard for a week and every night we'd buy, we, you know, the silkies would be right by the boat and, you know, we play music and we went through literally everybody's iPod who was on board, you know, we like the full gamut, like Adele to like hard rock to like heavy metal to everything. And, you know, the captain thought all of this, he was just, he he wasn't buying this at all but we finally captain we're like come on we, you know we know you got some mariachi on there you know <laughs> and so we hooked up his ipod and uh the silky sharks really liked mariachi mm -hmm. <laughs> so so i think we kind of won over the captain with that one a little bit but it's funny because i thought you wanted to keep the silkies away <laughs> yeah, but I, <laughs> what brings him in is mariachi out of it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, now I know what to avoid. What, yeah. what to avoid? Don't put on mariachis. Keep some <laughs> away. You'll be good to go. <laughs> so, switching over to another another so topic. Um, yeah. What threatens sharks? Like, is there anything in particular that sharks are scared of? Basically. Yeah, um, so there's a, a few different animals which um, sharks will be wary of. So there's one fish in particular called the Goliath grouper. It's massive, and they're found in Florida a lot. And um, they will chase away sharks. They'll bite them. They'll chase away sharks. Dolphin have been known. Uh, other sharks will also bite and eat smaller sharks. Um, and then the true apex predator of the ocean is the, the sea panda, otherwise known as the killer whale. So the killer whales are, are really, even a great white, they will basically flip them over and with surgical like precision, they will remove the liver out of them because the liver is a really high nutrient dense uh, food source for them. That's of course, crazy. like the biggest threat to all sharks is, is humans. You know, and we're killing between 100 to 300 million sharks per year, which is completely unsustainable, which, uh, you know, is the practice of basically cutting the fins off 
um, and then releasing the shark back. Of course, it doesn't survive. And the fins are, are really used in, uh, in a soup uh, that's traditionally only used for weddings, that kind of thing. And then the final product, uh, which almost approaches shark finning, is shark liver oil. So shark liver oil uh, is used in a lot of different supplements, but also in cosmetics. Um, because it has a really, it has a, a property that makes it feel very similar to mm -hmm. human uh, oil. So um, that's kind of more awareness is coming out of that, um, mainly because the larger the, the, the liver on the shark, the older that that shark is. So it mm -hmm. kind of is one of those things where, you know, Typically, if anybody's fishing for a liver, it's going to be something that's really old and that maybe doesn't reproduce as quickly. And where would you see that in products, like in the store? Oh, well, um, so if you're even at uh, Walmart or Target uh, or online, you can see shark liver oil as supplements. So some people take it for, you know, for example, kind of almost if, if they're uh, having cartilage issues or, mm -hmm. you know, arthritis. And the issue is, so it's really easily, readily available anywhere, I mean, pretty much well, any, uh, you know, pharmacy across the states. Or, you know. But the problem is, is that you don't know which shark that liver oil is taken from. Gotcha. So it might be sustain. it might be from something that is species which is totally sustainable mm -hmm. uh, or not overfished. But more than often than not, you know, you're going to have a mixture of stuff in there. And it might be from a completely endangered species or one that's even worse than endangered. So that's truly where the problem comes from. That's we also get shark cartilage, you know. Mm -hmm. So if you go in a, a pharmacy area, you probably see some shark products. I, well, I was um, thrown off by that when you mentioned that in the, in the presentation because I thought stuff like that was illegal. Yeah. Especially in the U.S. So you were saying that even places in Tucson sells shark fin soup. Yes. And so does that make that legal here, in at least in Arizona or the U.S.? I yeah. Think? In fact, shark fin soup is, is totally legal. Um, and in some places, shark finning is still legal. So um, Florida is one of the largest, I think it's the seventh largest exporter of shark fins in the world. So it is one of these problems, which we think is, you know, somewhere else, yeah. but it, it's really quite here. Um, so yeah, we do have, uh, we do have that. And, and it's not just the States. I mean, Canada is, is, is bad as well. I mean, pretty much, well, any uh, country that has a population of sharks, mm -hmm. you're going to have uh, people who are targeting it just because it's so valuable. I mean, shark, Fins, I mean, pound for pound are, you know, uh, up there with cocaine, you know, so, yeah. and shark liver oil is even, even more so, so. So if I personally want to go and help the sharks and help protect them, what can I do as an individual? Don't consume shark products just because you don't know where they're coming from. It might, again, it might be that liver oil, number one, there's no scientific studies that it actually does anything for you. Right. Two, you don't know what species that's from. So that's how you stop it. If once the demand for that product stops, then the problem stops. Um, so if you don't buy, then there's no issue. If you want to help sharks as well, you can uh, write. So for example, today um, is the, at the Geneva Convention, they are right now hopefully um, doing some new legislation to protect sharks. So for okay. example, a big one is going to be Mako, whether or not Mako gets worldwide protection. Oh, wow. So if you see, for example, a petition or if there's some way that you can write your legislator, you know, oftentimes we see these things going around on Facebook mm -hmm. and it's really easy to be a Facebook activist and just say, click on dislike right. or whatever. But mm -hmm. Really, that next step that you have to take is writing into your government. So mm -hmm. making your voice heard that way. Um, when you're on holiday, so it's really easy, even though, you know, that shark jaw might look really cool and impressive, you know, 
that fishermen didn't find it on on the floor. Right. You know, this bed or whatever. <laughs> it didn't wash up on shore. It didn't wash up on shore. Same mm -hmm. with his shark jewelry. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't wash up on shore. But you know, when we are going to these different cultures and different countries, you know, what's important is a lot of these fishermen. This is how they've made their living. And so it is very, very difficult um, right. to just say, hey, listen, you know what, you shouldn't be fishing, you mm -hmm. know, that, that shark is protected. So what we try and do is we try and give them an alternative. So what's happening now is that um, a shark is worth, I think, scientifically, you know, they've done the studies and it's worth about 10 times more alive than it is dead. So we're able to, and a lot of the governments are, and conservationists are trying to help shark fishermen turn into uh, shark ambassadors. So instead of uh, offering like uh, fishing tours, they'll bring mm -hmm. tourists out um, to uh, snorkel and shark watch. And what's happening is that the locals are making far more money than they ever did uh, fishing. And so they're able to sustain their families and, you know, much better. And the shark wins as well. Hmm. So if you want to help sharks, maybe you want to go see some for sure. Mm -hmm. The next time you're on holiday, you know, perhaps do some shark tourism. That'd be really cool. And I think, well, if people know more about sharks too, and that they're not so aggressive as everybody yeah. says, yeah. but they'll be more willing to go on a holiday and see these sharks. Absolutely. And I tell you, you know, once you've been in the water with sharks and actually seen them for yourself, your mm -hmm. whole opinion of them just completely changes. I know. It's so nice. And is there, oh, you mentioned FedEx too in the... Oh, yeah. FedEx. So FedEx is the last company mm -hmm. that's uh, exporting. Well, that's, that's basically um, shipping mm -hmm. uh, shark fins. So uh, you can write to FedEx and let them know. Um, they're sick of hearing from me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if you just voice your concern, I mean, there's a, you know, UPS isn't doing it. Everybody else isn't doing it. And it's really, you know, anytime that you have any wild animal, you know, mm -hmm. road, ivory, anything like that, um, man, I, I just think that we each have our own responsibility and critics specifically should really, you know, yeah, they just need to cut that out. But if I was going to write FedEx a letter, what exactly would I say in that letter? Can you give us any examples? From what you understand, you know, sharks are absolutely imperative that we're, you know, that their role, basically what they are doing is they are aiding, um, you know, uh, the, the call, the shark call. So mm -hmm. they might not be the ones who are sitting there slicing off the fins, right. but they might as well be because... If there is no way for them to get to, you know, market in Asia, then, um, then that really presents a barrier. And are is there any current projects you're working on now? Or any yes, so, upcoming uh, projects? Maybe? Yeah, the project that I've been working on for the last, uh, since 2017, so it's the one that I'm working on right now, is uh, it's a long-term photographic project that uh, focuses on ecologically unique areas of the ocean. Mm -hmm. So, and these ones are specifically uh, important shark habitat. So they're based on what are called hope spots. And hope spots, there's about 82 of them worldwide right now. And they're very, very special areas which are critical to the health of the ocean. They might okay. have a very special feature to them. Um, they might be along major migration corridors or nursing areas or rural, like a a large population of at-risk species kind of reside, something like that. So that's what I've been working on. And the ones that I've been focusing on are important shark habitat. So, mm -hmm. for example, you know, I do a lot of work in the Rivia Hijedo Archipelago, which is a small chain of volcanic islands about 240 miles off the coast of Cabo San Lucas. And this area, it's a shark nursery. So silver tips, you get to see some baby sharks Aww. this last fall, which was really amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just like this, this area where a lot of these sharks are coming through on major migrations. And this island uh, provides a, a feeding area, but also an area where they can get cleaned of parasites. Um, 
so that's pretty much well what I've been focusing on. I've been Revia Hijedo. I've been doing a lot of work in the Sea of Cortez. Um, I've been doing some stuff in Cabo Pulmo, which is a really, really cool story. Um, I don't know if we have time to get into it, but that's kind of what, what started this whole process. It's a little fishing village. I'll tell you anyway. So in 1995, <laughs> there was this uh, small fishing village which uh -huh. comprised of 15 families. And these, they were finding that in their bay, they were, they were struggling to find fish. You know, they were having to go further and further out every single day just to, you know, survive. Mm -hmm. And they had this little um, coral reef in their bay, which kind of drew a small number of tourists every year. And the fishing boats were just decimating this coral reef. So in 1995, they petitioned the government to create their first marine park. And um, what's happened since then is it has become a conservation success story that's heralded around the world. Wow. Since 1995, that area has seen a 450% increase in fish biomass with a, a return of some species which haven't been seen since the 1980s. Wow. So their barrier reef, that coral reef, is estimated to be 20,000 years old. So it's the oldest on mm -hmm. the you know, west side of North America. So what's really special about that story is that you have a group of just regular people, a small group of regular people who had the bravery to change their life. That story is kind of what spurred this entire project because mm -hmm. You know, if you have a if you have a small group of people like that, then what's stopping the rest of us? We can all take the action. Imagine if so many other people continue to do that, and you can inspire more people. Our oceans will be full of sea life again. Exactly, exactly. And this is the thing: is as we, you know, especially nowadays, we hear we hear a lot of negative things. We hear, you know, a lot of doom and gloom. But right. Equally important are the success stories, mm -hmm. you know, equally important are the, are the, you know, small communities who are standing behind it, who are fighting, um, you know, to save their oceans and their save their livelihoods. So, you know, I have Cabo Pulmo and then in December coming up, um, I'm planning on going to a place called New Caledonia and mm -hmm. New Caledonia is, um, there's, a little bit further, if you imagine where New Zealand is, it's a little that way. Mm -hmm. And diving there is like diving a hundred years ago. So it's one of the last few places that's absolutely pristine on the planet. And what's it called again? It's called New Caledonia. Okay. And there's a few things that make New Caledonia incredibly special. First off, it's the largest continuous barrier reef in the world. So we always think of, you know, the Great Barrier Reef as being really big. Well, this one is continuous and it's larger than the Great Barrier Reef. It also has uh, the highest diversity of coral formations anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also, it's got a shark nursery area. It's got like all these amazing things about it in this tiny, tiny little island. Is it so super protected? Yeah, well, this is the other thing that's kind of cool about it is that it has uh, their indigenous population is called the Kanaks and the Kanak tribe. You know, basically, throughout generation and generation and generation, um, conservation has been part of just who they are, and that's how they live because they have this deep connection with the sea. And so that's one of the main reasons why this area has uh, has been the way it is. Mm -hmm. Now, you have a Kanak tribe, but you also have um, a population of French uh, people. And what's interesting is that you have a whole little society there that has this amazing gem of a location that's completely pristine. And it's interesting to see um, how they're going about, like going forward, how they're managing these resources because mm -hmm. they have their history of you know generations past, but also they're kind of at a little bit of a crux within the island itself. So one of their main industries is mining and uh, the mining is starting to run out. So the whole, their, 
they're kind of having to balance this. Okay, one resource is being depleted. They have this other resources, which is ecotourism. Right. And I find it's really interesting how they're going to kind of propel that going in the future. Yeah. So that's kind of the next project in December. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah, it should be really neat. Um, and next month, September, it's not shark related, but I'm going to be diving with um, humpbacks and calves. So I'm really, that's going to be pretty neat. Um, it's the first time that I've really been in the water with um, whales and their offspring. So mm -hmm. that should be really, really interesting. That's on my bucket list too. It is. is the humpbacks, yeah. yeah. Because I'm moving to New Zealand in a few months, so it's like yeah. I want to know where all these places oh are. That way, goodness. I can just hop on over. Oh, That's really fantastic. cool. So, if anyone wants to see these adventures of yours, where mm -hmm. can they follow you? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. So, Facebook and Instagram. It's Samantha Schwann. S A M A N T H A S C H W A N N. And then, of course, I have my website as well, www.samanthaschwan.com. Um, but most of my stuff, I think, it is on Instagram. Although I, you know, I blog whenever I can on mm -hmm. my website and try and kind of keep up there. Um, but yeah, I definitely love uh, love connecting with everybody. I try and do as many talks as I can, and I try and speak wherever and whenever I can. So. Um, if they keep uh, up to date with me there, I can, if I'm doing any presentations, I can kind of, you know, note them there. And I'll make sure to link all that in the show notes below. If anyone wants to check out her work and her upcoming projects and to wrap this all up, is there anything that uh, you want someone to take back with them while listening from the podcast? Like what's the one thing they should take from this? Well, sharks? um, I think that, you know, sharks are, really, really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, their sensory systems are absolutely way better than ours. They're the total superheroes of the ocean. And I think the one thing is, is that they're not what they're meant to, to be, or they're not what they're portrayed to be in, in the movies. So I think if I can just change somebody's perception just a little bit, mm -hmm. just a little bit, then, then, you know, that makes me feel great. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really thank appreciate you for having me time and talking about sharks and your passion. And uh, well, thanks really so much. It. It's mm -hmm. been a real pleasure. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you, everyone, so much for listening. I want to give the biggest thank you to Samantha for joining me on the podcast and sharing your passion and explaining about everything you believe in. Uh, it was really, really cool. And I learned a lot, so I hope everyone learned a few things as well about what we can do to help protect sharks, or if you learned anything new about sharks. Um, I think everything she explained was very informational, and you can really hear and see the passion that she has for these sharks. So if you have any questions for Samantha, or we just even want to say thank you for all her hard work, I'm going to link all her social media, her website that she mentioned, uh, below in the show notes and on my YouTube channel. So if you want to reach out and say hi, feel free to do so because I'm, I'm sure she'll love to hear all your comments and your feedback from the podcast. That'll be really cool. And also, speaking about feedback and comments, I've been getting a lot of comments from the plastic episode, which is really, really cool because I kind of figured that Maybe because you hear about plastic a lot and on social media and in our news today that it's a big deal and um, I didn't think anyone would care as much. So it was really cool that people are still interested and they still want to hear tips about how they can reduce plastic. So one of the suggestions I've been getting or ideas was maybe at the end of each episode I can explain a new tip or trick. That about how to reduce plastic waste, which is really cool. So I decided to start with this podcast. So this episode, um, I think the biggest plastic waste that we um, acquire in our everyday lives is when you go grocery shopping. So that was the hardest trick for me when I did the three months no plastic challenge was grocery shopping. So um, I purchased these little sheer bags um, 
through Amazon. I think they also sell them at Sprouts and like Whole Foods, all the natural food stores. Um, so you can get them locally or you can get them through Amazon. So I'll put them in the link below. But they're little sheer bags. Um, I have clearer ones in my car. I just didn't want to go out and grab them. Uh, but you put your vegetables, your fruit in it, and then it comes in a big pack of like 10 or 12. And so you have plenty to bring with you. And you don't have to use those plastic bags because that helps a lot. Because, um, I mean, I know people use them maybe for, if they have a dog, they use them as poop bags. I used to use them as poop bags. Um, but I use biodegradable ones now. Uh, but that's such a big difference that you can use. And you when you go grocery shopping, maybe like every other week, every week, I don't know. But it makes a huge difference. And they're really cheap. So... That's my tip trick for this week. Um, I'll, like I said, I'll put that in the show notes as well below. And if you guys have any ideas about how you can reduce plastic or any tips that you want to give me, because I'm still learning as I go every day, um, reach out to me as well. Uh, I have my own email, oliviacpodcast at gmail. And social media is a great way to reach out to me. Um, but I love hearing everyone's feedback and yeah, that's all I got. It's a long ending, but I'll try to keep it shorter for the next ones and try to get more of a routine down. But you know, we are all in this together to either save the sharks or reduce less plastic. So, you know, we all want to do our part in taking care of the environment. And I think it's really important that you guys do so. And I'm glad you guys are reaching out for me to do that. So the more I can give you guys for information, the better. And yeah, okay, that's it. For reals, that's all I got. So thank you guys for listening. And I post every other Monday new episodes. So I'll see you guys in a couple weeks.